Welcome, welcome, welcome to This Week in Pharmacy. I am your host, Todd Gray, founder of the Pharmacy Podcast Network. It is the week ending March 8th. It's March 8th already, 2024. Wow. I tell you what, there is so much momentum going into this uh, second quarter already, um, this last month here in the first quarter, and it's been really exciting to be um, a part of the media, be part of publications and working with national associations and watch the progress that's being, making, that's being made in um, PBM reform and how we know that the biggest three PBMs, um, Express Scripts, Optum, and CVS Caremark, or I guess they just call it CVS Health now, right? Um, they finally are getting some massive attention from organizations like the National Association of um, Community Pharmacies, or the National Community Pharmacists Association, NCPA, um, a shout out to Putt, Pharmacists United for Truth and Transparency and all of their work, um, amazing work that they're doing through social media, through interviews, through content development. I do want to give a shout out to Mark Cuban, and uh, not that he needs it, uh, any recognition from uh, This Week in Pharmacy, but wouldn't that be amazing? We could get him on this show uh, with Antonio Chacha. That would be a uh, a dream interview for me, maybe sprinkle in a little drug uh, channels, uh, Dr. Adam Fine. I don't know if you guys follow drug channels. What a wonderful resource of data. But those kinds of people coming together, speaking about true reform and what it means. It's not just a, a buzzword, but the structural um, abilities to use funding to cover medication, to cover treatments, to cover follow up to cover the necessary uh, need that our patients have with medication management and what that means. And it, it really needs to move, we all know, uh, away from the dispensing fee. Dispensing really should have very little to do with it. It should be all about safety, all about monitoring, all about uh, double checking. And those kinds of fees need to be placed into paying a pharmacist for what, for what they actually do. Uh, you could probably pay a pharmacy technician associated with the dispensing fee, which is very process driven. There's a lot of automation out there that's doing a lot of the work. There's artificial intelligence that's now doing some of the work. But the human element and the nerdiness and the scientist that's digging into how medications are impacting humans, and if they should even be on that medication in the first place with testing and pharmacogenomics and um, I want to bring up and uh, want to get into our program today and want to start with some news. And really, uh, this is this is something I want to bring to the listeners' attention. And there's an article that just came out today. It says, ADHD medication shortage impacts local, local pharmacies. Um, this is not just specific to Omaha. This is from uh, 3KM TV News uh, now in Omaha. We know that this is happening throughout the country. They interview a pharmacist about this. Uh, according to CBS News, generics of brand name drugs are also hard to find. They're interviewing Kohl's Pharmacy uh, in Kristen McClola, president um, and pharmacist. I'm sorry, Kristen McClola. Um, pharmacist uh, was was saying that oftentimes uh, they have to uh, do massive search. Um, often they have to work with the provider. So if you need a 20 milligram dose, you can get the 10 milligram dose um, uh, done one and, and half tablets. And this is a, a big deal. But the reason why I'm mentioning this and what I just said before showing you this article and mentioning this article, pharmacists in times of medication, um, not having the resources. Think back in the day. Think back when the pharmacist in the United States, for example, really started being implanted in their communities and how it was a doctor slash pharmacist, probably mixture, especially if they were involved in, in caring for animals and caring for people. It was all the same person within that community, right? And there's a lot of compounding. Pharmacists have the ability to make up 
and maybe compound something or maybe create something for their patient if in fact there was a shortage. Now, that's not realistic in, in some of these big cities where you have uh, you know, a thousand, 2000 prescriptions a day being handled by massive pharmacies. However, that goes back to why and how we're paying pharmacists to allow them to do what they need to do and have the time to do it. Because if they're paid to do that, and if they're paid to slow down a little bit and help their patient access medications, obviously resourcing the ADHD medication would be great. But we know functional pharmacy is rising and we know that pharmacists have the capability of making suggestions to their patients as they should be able to do about uh, about substances in your diet and how that how that affects you as a human and what could you do in place of an ADHD medication? What could you suggest in the form of a supplement, in the form of a possibly another medication and making a suggestion, communicating with a physician uh, and making that kind of switch in order to get something that could help uh, the patient? And I think that there's a payment ability to get into consulting and consulting software with our pharmacist in collaboration with physicians and, and coming up with other solutions. But all right, so back to PBM and the Alabama da Daily News just coming out today. Uh, they say House Committee passes a pharmacy reimbursement bill. This is exciting because it's happening everywhere finally. It's really, it's. I think it started with Ohio. Uh, if we go back in the history of when the cracks really started to show up with PBMs, a shout out to Antonio Chacha again and all of his work with 46 Brooklyn and access advisors, three access advisors, and what they do to expose by extracting data, analyzing the data and making it palatable, making it usable, especially to our uh, Congress and lawmakers and Senate that might know, not understand PBMs and how hard and difficult it is to follow them by design, by design. But I want you to know about this stuff as a pharmacist, as a technician listening to this podcast right now, be aware of what's happening in PBM reform and do not think for a second that you don't have an influence in this because you do. I'm going to share something with you after we get finished up with this news. But this is from N NBC News just today. And it says, pharmacies overwhelmed by the massive cyber attack. This is still going on. Pharmacies are struggling a week-long ransomware attack on the biggest company that processes insurance for many pharmacies and other healthcare providers once again, I don't want to keep beating the horse of PBM reform, but isn't it interesting when too many big, huge entities have too much control over 80% of the prescription processing goes through the three biggest PBMs and by not diversifying where these prescriptions are flowing, especially for processing claims, you are subjecting our public health to uh, three organizations and switches, whereas you open up to the independents, you open up to other sources of pharmacy for the sake of public health. And it should be that way, instead of having this bottleneck now with uh, a couple entities uh, slowing down payment processing. And this is affecting our physicians as well. Re I read a terrible uh, article that was attached to um, a tweet on Twitter, and it was horrible that there are physicians out there that can't staff, can't pay their bills, and uh, what they're going through with um, claims processing. So it's not just, we know it's not just prescriptions. Hey, I want to talk about Twitter for just a second. Now, we know that Twitter is now called X. We know that it is not as popular as it used to be as a platform, but the reason why I want to mention it. If you have a Twitter account and you haven't been active on it, would you please go to Twitter and just send a message of appreciation, just letting Mark Cuban, his his uh, tweet, he uses Twitter all the time, by the way, and he pays attention to his tweets, okay? So I think this is a powerful opportunity for the pharmacy profession to show uh, Mark Cuban some appreciation for what he did when he stood before the Washington DC panel recently, I think this was about a week ago, 
And he made a powerful statement of how the PBMs are wrecking healthcare, are destroying communities based on drying up of community pharmacies, drying up of our retail chains that have to shut down locations. They are they're eating their own. Isn't it isn't it isn't it weird to to watch CVS close stores because their own PBM is creating an impossibility for them to stay profitable for those pharmacy care outlets that many far many communities desperately need, which I think as soon as we get through this and we we stabilize, I think it's going to be the rise of independent community pharmacy being able to rebuild our population needed numbers of outlets for pharmacy care. But would you go to Twitter, please? His, um, Mark's, uh, Mark Cuban, Mr. Cuban's Twitter uh, handle is at M-C-U-B-A-N. So M Cuban, tweet him at Mark Cuban and just tell him that you appreciate him and tell him that you're a pharmacist. Tell him that you're a pharmacy technician. Tell him stories. But let's, let's get more attention around this by using his uh, platform and his attention that he's drawing. You know what? I don't. It frustrates me, uh, and I'm sure if you're listening, you're on your way to work or you're in the car whenever you're listening to this podcast. By the way, thank you for listening. It is frustrating when we see celebrities bring attention to things that have been major issues for years. PBM reform was never paid attention to as much as it is now. It's on fire. All three PBMs are are now being investigated in ways and being watched in ways that they've never done before. So the tension that Mark gives us uh, in the profession of pharmacy is very important. I know that there is a motive within Mark's world. I don't think he ever does anything just strictly for the goodness of mankind. Although I think he knows that it's good to disrupt the three big PBMs. I know he knows. He's smart. He's in, he's he's a genius, a business genius. And he knows that this is an opportunity to help mankind in our nation. And I think he wants to help. Matter of fact, I know he wants to help based on what some of the things that he's doing. Cost plus uh, drugs or Mark Cuban's cost plus drugs. There are components of that that don't impress me, that do impress me. I'm sure that you feel the same way. Um, but there is an opportunity now to start creating facets of control for pharmacies out there with the rise of cost plus and the cost plus models. It doesn't have to just come from Mark Cuban. The wholesalers, the secondary wholesalers, the tertiary wholesalers, the platforms like Esri RX and, and Real Value RX, and, um, and so many of these creative organizations are giving pharmacies, privately owned pharmacies, new opportunities to source their medications and get away from insurance altogether. We almost have to teach the public that they do not always need to pull that insurance card. And I love the analogy that I've heard from Kyle McCormick here out of Pittsburgh uh, from Blueberry Pharmacy cost plus uh, model. He takes 100% cash-based payment, no insurance. And he has taught his community that you don't need to use your insurance for the majority of your prescriptions. Maybe some of your more expensive medications. Uh, Mark made some references to specialty pharmacy and how there's nothing special about specialty pharmacy. Specialty pharmacy <laughs> rose in a time when PBMs weren't as involved. And there is a track and there is a need for pharmacists who dig down into very specific disease states and then manage those disease states and those conditions, which is AKA specialty pharmacy. So. While I disagree with Mark Cuban, I know what he was saying. He was saying that the PBMs get involved now and call it specialty, uh, call lots of medications specialty to get as much money out of the transaction as possible. So I absolutely see that. But we know that specialty is a real deal. And I just want to uh, give you a shout out, the power of social media. It's a new communications module. Are you on social media? If you are, your patients are watching you. People are watching you. Industry is watching you. Make reference to things in the current events. Uh, if you're on Instagram, please follow us at Pharmacy Podcast. If you're on Twitter, we're at Pharmacy Podcast. 
any of our social medias, it's usually that. But we would love to hear from you. I want to hear your ideas about, about drug shortages, about burnout, your position, what you want to do. Today's exciting because I'm going to get to talk to you about uh, medical science liaisons and how that role is just exploding for that opportunity. That role is exploding for pharmacists. So we're going to talk about that. Hey, I want to share the future of Pennsylvania pharmacy at the Pennsylvania Pharmacists Association. Uh, this was a great event. I got to attend the annual event. We just put out coverage. It's part one of two. I want you to listen to this. There are some amazing interviews and people in the state of Pennsylvania doing things that we should spread throughout the nation. Uh, Sarah Lynn Farewell, uh, Dr. Farewell will be a guest from, she is a medical science liaison from, Novo, uh, from Novavax and how her leadership in vaccine has become, once again, a vertical for pharmacists. Goodness gracious. Combining pharmacists with the world of immunizations, I mean, it's 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 something all in, a, in and of itself. And we see pharmacists rising. Um, we know Dr. Kohler has been on the pharmacy podcast sec several times. Epidemiologist, pharmacist, a rare disease, uh, digging down into future pandemics and plagues. That's exciting. We also want to talk uh, with Eric Cushy from uh, a pharmacist owner in Pennsylvania, Curtis Pharmacy. Uh, John Minkin from Nimble RX, which is an interesting platform for independent community pharmacies, saving you money. Anthony Mahajan from Health Law Alliance. Dr. Mack, Dr. Mayak Amin, the champion Superman pharmacist that was covered by national news is on our program. I'm so proud to have Dr. Mack on. He is a special spirit and he shines a light a bright light in his community. And as a pharmacist, I'm so proud of him. It come, pharmacy comes from that man's heart and it, it shines to his patients and his community loves him. But take a listen to his interview. Jenna Quinn, my goodness gracious, this woman, this pharmacist, this PharmD, uh, this, this woman is just amazing. She's a researcher. She's an angry mother, but in a good way, not a, not a crazy angry, a very, a very detailed, uh, uh, focused anger uh, to dig into what's happening with our children and certain medications and very investigative and very evidence-based. I love listening to her podcast. She's one of our podcasters on the Pediatric Pharmacist Review. She's on our press coverage for the Pennsylvania Pharmacists Association 2024. A shout out to PrimeRx for sponsoring that show. PrimeRx is a pharmacy management system. They're doing wonderful things in technology for community pharmacies and long-term care pharmacies. And also RX Safe. RX Safe has come a long, long way. And they were one of our first sponsors. A shout out to RX Safe. Take a look at rxsafe.com. If you're thinking about automation or implementing op automation or expansion of your business, definitely reach out to the RX Safe team. We have uh, more to share with you. Ural Pharma has been a new sponsor of ours. We're so excited to welcome them to the Pharmacy Podcast Network. They are going to be working with pain care specialists. If you are a pain care specialist, if you are a pain care pharmacist, and you'd like to participate in some discussions around pain management and some of the options that Ural Pharma presents, here is their message. Meet Ural Pharma, a dynamic newcomer to the U.S. generics marketplace. Ural Pharma's current portfolio focuses on high-quality authorized generic medicines in the acute pain and endocrinology therapeutic areas. Backed by its parent company, IBSA, a multinational pharmaceutical company headquartered in Switzerland, Ural Pharma has harnessed IBSA's cutting-edge drug delivery technologies and has made great strides in expanding access to its products across the U.S. Looking ahead, Ural Pharma is committed to delivering complex generic medicines across a broad spectrum of therapeutic areas. To learn more, including important safety information about its products, visit UralPharmaInc.com. That's Y-A-R-A-L PharmaInc.com and connect with them on LinkedIn.
great content about options for pain management. They were talking about their lidocaine patch 5%. We have Dr. Mark Garofoli that's going to participate on a podcast with you all talking about pain management. I love Mark. He's known as hashtag the pain guy. Um, pain guy is now a trademark. So that's really cool that Mark, by the way, I should talk to Mark about branding. Uh, you as a pharmacist out there, even you as a technician, a pharmacy tech out there. If you, if you are in this forever, if you're in the profession of pharmacy, like I am, this is your world. This is your life. You're going to be in pharmacy one way or another, maybe not necessarily in retail chain or something, but something, but please remember your online brand. Mark, for example, he hashtagged or he not hashtag, he uses the hashtag, of course, as pain guy, but he took the time to trademark pain guy and he builds blogs, he builds content, he builds podcasts around that theme. And that's really having him stand out. Now he is a professor at WVU School of Pharmacy, does work there, he does work in his community. His uh, wife is a also a pharmacist, a community pharmacy a pharmacist down in Morgantown, West Virginia. They have a brand. They have a knowledgeable brand. He's active on LinkedIn and other sources of social media. Remember that you are in control of your career and those golden handcuffs, as they say, if you're making you know, a, a pretty substantial salary in retail chain pharmacy and you're, you're, you're feeling burnt out, if you rely upon the reputation that you have driven through content development, through blogging, through podcasting, from guests on other podcasts, from going to your national and state pharmacy associations and conferences and becoming a speaker and becoming involved, that's the way that you differentiate yourself and you insulate your career. You insulate yourself from having to worry about being stuck. I don't ever want to feel stuck in my career. And I did. I felt stuck many, many times, especially when I was in the telecom business. I was in telecommunications. And that is a boring world of, of very little creativity. But I was in that for eight years. I was making a ton of money. I had to lose money to make a transfer from telecommunications to pharmacy when I took the position in pharmacy software. And when I made that transition, I cut my income almost in half in order to grow up into something new. And sometimes you're going to have to do that through your career, but sometimes you don't have to if you've insulated yourself as being known in the industry. And then, of course, if you want to make a change, people know with you and your network becomes extremely powerful. We had an episode on networking, if you remember that, on This Week in Pharmacy about two or three weeks ago. All right, let's talk about networking. Let's talk about the Pharmacy Profit Summit Live. Pharmacy Podcast Network is going to Dallas tomorrow on Saturday, and we are going to be talking with pharmacy owners uh, wanting to change their lives and change their businesses. Lisa Fass, Dr. Fass, and her staff will be guiding a bunch of uh, speakers, amazing speakers. Some of these people are Pharmacy 50 Award winners. Uh, which are just standout people. Of course, Lisa has made the list on Pharmacy 53 years in a row. Pharmacy Profit Summit Live is in at the Omni in Dallas. If you are in the area and uh, you have an opportunity to go to this conference, do it. If you're in the area and you don't have time to go to the conference and you want to network, get a hold of us. We're going to probably be at the Omni Dallas uh, bar area. It would be so much fun to put a gathering of Dallas-based pharmacists together. If anybody knows Mark Cuban, tell him to show up. Let's have some drinks with Mark Cuban at the Omni Dallas and and uh, and give him support. I'd definitely buy him a drink for, <laughs> for his exposure of PBM. So shout out to Lisa and the team, uh, Pharmacy Profit Summit Live happening. One of our clients, uh, Happier at Home, uh, Debbie, Marcella will be at the event. She'll be talking about how do you use home care to grow your community pharmacy business? Think about this. If you're a pharmacist in a community right now and you have a community pharmacy, this is a no brainer to open up one of these franchises and start building your own home care business within it. And I've heard arguments from pharmacy owners, even right here in, in Pittsburgh, in the Pittsburgh area, that they've said, we don't want to disrupt our relationships with other home care agencies 
And while I understand that, I understand relationships and businesses, it's your destiny. And if you can generate more revenue and more services for your community and assure that your community pharmacy stays afloat, maybe this is bigger than just uh, pissing off a couple of your home care agencies that, that bring business to you, unless you have contracts with them, sustainable contracts, three-year and five-year contracts. If you don't and you like those relationships, I would advise talk with your lawyer, talk with them as a partner, ask if they'd be willing to sign some kind of collaborative agreement with you, marketing, a co-marketing agreement with you. But home care services must expand and Happier at Home is a way to do it. And embedding a Happier at Home franchise into your community pharmacy could make a huge difference in your profitability and generating um, a bunch of new dollars as well as uh, opportunities for new staff, new jobs in your community, and obviously services that are desperately needed with how many seniors are going to be popping up over the next, uh, you know, next 20 years, really. It's, it's a, it's, it's the rush of the baby boomers and even us Gen Xers <laughs> that are going to be reaching those, uh, those retirement ages. And we're going to need our pharmacists more than ever. All right. APHA 2024. Are you going, are you going to Orlando on March 22nd, 20 and 25th? Pharmacy Podcast is so proud to be APHA's press uh, partner, press and podcast partner. We'll be inside the APHA booth. Please come find us. Please come take a picture, see me, see uh, Kevin Jones, who will be with me there. Let's talk. Let's plan. Let's talk about the, ser the services that you're going to be uh, creating or something you're going to be doing, something you're going to be publishing something that you are doing in our profession. I want technicians, pharmacists to participate in our post-show. We're looking for five to seven minute interviews from a bunch of pharmacists about any topic under the sun that impacts pharmacy care and the role of our pharmacist expansion. So APHA 2024 annual meeting and exposition, March 22nd through 25th, we are excited. Are you linked up on LinkedIn with Pharmacy Podcast Network? Please go to LinkedIn. Please go to the Pharmacy Podcast Network's uh, page. Follow us. We have discussions there. We have blog postings there. And if you'd like to write, if you are a writer um, over podcasting, please think about the world of blogging again and work with us. We would love to get your publication in a um in a on a platform called medical life i don't know if you've heard about this but medical life is a collection of physicians pharmacists nurses administrators business people technologists i love this this is like my medium even though medium is a great blog blogging platform uh, medical life is amazing and it, and it brings a ton of content to our providers and actually in collaboration with uh, providers. And um, they have another publication called Being Well. We have uh, Dar uh, Darshan Kulkarni uh, gonna start writing for, but then also uh, Hussein, um, Dr. Hussein, who's the sports pharmacy podcaster, uh, Huma Humesh, uh, Dr. Hussein Humesh. And, he is a brilliant writer, and um, he's being published on Being Well and, of course, Medical Life as well. If you have, once again, didn't I say building your brand online, this is the way you do it. You need to get your voice out. You need to get your writings out. You need to get your name out and just make that a part of your journey and a part of your um, career and insulate yourself. Insulate yourself from ever feeling trapped and or burnout. Hey, we want to um, give a shout out to Dr. Marcy Strauss. Uh, she is going to be presenting some information to us. Can't wait for you to, to hear this. Marcy is a champion for community pharmacists and pharmacists, uh, health system pharmacists. She does a lot of work um, in the state of Maryland. She is Maryland's president right now of the Maryland Pharmacists Association. Let's hear from Dr. Strauss. 
Hi, I'm Marcy Strauss, a pharmacist and president of the Maryland Pharmacists Association. I'll be your host for this segment and we'll be discussing state pharmacy associations, specifically what they do and why they are so important, especially in today's changing and challenging pharmacy landscape. And also be discussing related opportunities for pharmacists. So if you're one of our listeners and you're a student pharmacist, or maybe you're a new practitioner, or at any point in your career and, and thinking about a transition, trying something new or getting more involved in the profession, you've come to the right place. And associations are so important, especially today when pharmacists and pharmacy teams are facing so many challenges across all different areas. And associations really serve as a voice for the profession and work to advocate for the profession. So advocacy is such a critical part of what associations do. And you may be thinking, well, I don't know what the associ these associations do for me. What do they currently do? I don't know if I feel like I have a voice. Well, definitely associations want to hear and need to hear from you, pharmacists out in the world and their members. And when it comes to especially advocacy and making those critical changes and, and advancing the profession, they need to hear from pharmacists, from technicians, from their members. Now, for example, in, in MPHA, and for other associations as, as well, a lot of the policies that associations utilize that help to really drive advocacy efforts with state governments comes from ideas that members submit through their House of Delegates. So for example, at, at MPHA, we submit or request resolutions and ideas. We want to hear from our members about what are things that are important to them? Where do they want and need to see change in the profession? And then that helps lead to policies that are adopted and that MPHA can then carry forward and utilize when they are advocating with the, the state government. But again, it all comes down to members, to you, um, to be able, we need to hear what's going on and to then be able to identify what are the key things that are important and need to be addressed in the profession. And it's something that we're, we're doing in Maryland is hosting a series of what we call getting to know you sessions. So these are, are kind of virtual town halls where we invite everyone, whether you're a member or not, pharmacist, student, technician, uh, stakeholder, we want to hear from you and what are the challenges that you're facing? What are what are your concerns? What do you want their, our state associations to be able to, to do? What, what is of interest? And getting that, that feedback and, and helping people to have a voice for, um, feel like they have a voice is, is so critical and can really help shape the the direction of, of the association and the work that that we do. When we think about some of the the big items that we hear about all the time online or, or in the news that are really impacting the profession, such as pharmacy workforce conditions, PBM reform, pharmacist payment for services, pharmacist scope of practice, advancing the the profession. These are a lot of things that associations are are working on right now. And yes, legislation, enacting new legislation is a lengthy process. It does take time, um, but states are making strides. You may have heard the, the news the other day from the Pennsylvania Pharmacists Association, where pharmacists can now um, enroll as providers in state Medicaid. And in Maryland last year, pharmacists uh, the state passed legislation where pharmacists can get paid for services. And we're in the process of working through the details and going through the imp determining what we need to do to help pharmacy teams implement that so they can actually get paid. And we actually have a billing task force through MPHA that is working to address just that. We think about what's next. Okay, we, we can get paid, but what do we need to do to actually get paid? So these are just some examples of what state associations such as PPA or MPHA are, are doing right now. In addition to, to advocacy, we're also working on 
strengthening the profession, helping support pharmacists in all areas within their, their practice settings, who, whether it's developing new tools and resources or connecting individuals with subject matter experts or hosting different education sessions and, and training programs. So, so many different ways that associations bring value and are so critical to advancing the, the profession. And when we think about opportunities for pharmacists and again, whether you're a student pharmacist and trying to think about, hey, what do I want to do in my career? Or you're a, a new practitioner trying to figure out what path do, do I want to take? Or maybe you're looking to transition to something else. Lots of different opportunities for pharmacists within state associations. It could be in areas such as policy and government affairs, professional affairs, or maybe it's pharmacy practice uh, could work to help support pharmacy teams in different practice areas, identifying and obtaining grants, developing tools and resources to support pharmacy teams. So a lot of different opportunities, and some of you may already be familiar with re uh, residencies, fellowships that some state associations offer, advanced practice rotation experiences, a lot of different ways. And also volunteering is a great way to learn more about the state association world and kind of see, hey, is this something that I want to, to do more of while also giving back to the, the profession? There's so many different paths that pharmacists can take to getting involved in, in this area. And, and whether you've gone through a residency and fellowship or or not uh, there's a lot of different opportunities that are are out there too so in, in future segments really want to and, and hope to be able to to deep dive and share with you just more details on some of the great things that are happening right now and that we are working on whether it's in an mpha or or other associations um so i'm just saying it's it's a challenging world out there, but hopefully you know, we want to, to give you some hope and you identify, hey, what are what are new opportunities out there for me? And yes, how can my how is my state association working to be a voice for me? And also where are there opportunities for me to have my my voice heard? So if if any of this resonates with you or you're looking to just learn more, I encourage you to, to reach out, whether it's a friend who's involved in your state association or reach out on the, the website. Uh, I know MPHA makes it easy to connect with, with others in, in the association uh, to, to learn more. And, you know, stay tuned. There's, there's always new things that are happening in the different states, uh, seeing new things all the time each month and looking forward to bringing you all exciting updates coming soon, especially in, in the world of pharmacist billing and, and scope of practice and reform. So I thank you all for listening in and I hope to see you on a future segment. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Marcy Strauss, Dr. Strauss. Great segments. And we are looking for more pharmacists to provide us subject matter expertise on this week in pharmacy. This is your this is your weekly program. So if you have ideas, something that you're interested in sharing, we have segment opportunities for you. Reach out to me. I'm uh, my, what do I want to give you? My email is publisher, the word publisher at pharmacypodcast.com. That's publisher at pharmacypodcast.com. Hey, let's get into our featured interview today about medical science liaisons and the role of the pharmacist. Hey, and on this week in pharmacy, I have an interesting opportunity to talk about another component, another sector of opportunities for our pharmacists. I think of so many pharmacists that I talk to week after week and into this new year. Um, can you believe that it's almost, we're going to be almost in March of 2024. And like, I, I still feel like I'm, I'm still almost wanting to say happy new year to people. And, um, and and see things that are changing in our industry at an accelerated rate. One of the places that pharmacists are rising and having a impact on healthcare um, in, in clinical trials, 
in um, representation of pharmaceutical manufacturers, in um, discussions with physicians and specialists is our medical science liaisons. And um, I think of pharmacists that we've talked with at um, the Pennsylvania Pharmacists Association just recently, several of them were there from Novavax and that's exactly what they were. They were medical science liaisons. That excites me because there are pharmacists who have a passion for business and have a extreme nerdy passion, scientific background passion to be medical science liaison. So how do you get into that? How do you become an MSL? How do you break into it? Um, this is exciting. So today we're going to interview um, a fellow podcaster, two fellow podcasters. Uh, Tom Caravella is the founder of MSL Talk, and this is an executive search firm from the Carolyn Group, which um, uh, also with him will be uh, Sarah Snyder. Dr. Sarah Snyder is a PharmD. She also is a podcaster. We'll talk more about uh, her podcast called uh, uh, The Running After Age 40 Podcast which is interesting. Shout out to Tony Guerra, our fellow podcaster and runner out there. But um, when we um, come back uh, from a quick break, we'll be talking with Tom and Sarah. You don't want to miss this. Hey, Tom and Sarah, welcome to This Week in Pharmacy. It's so good to have you here. Thanks, Todd. Hey, Tom. Looking forward to talking to you. All right, fellow podcasters, uh, this is exciting to talk with a uh, pharmacist, Sarah, that you've been, how long have you been podcasting? I started my podcast about three and a half years ago, but I've been an avid podcast listener since I think they've been around. So back before people knew what a podcast was, I was the person out there saying, oh, you should listen to this podcast. What about you, Tom? When did you start MSL Talks? So MSL Talk is going to be four years old in March. So I started it when COVID hit, coincidentally, um, in March of 2020. So the expansion of our medical science liaisons, we were talking before we started our interview about the expanding roles of our pharmacists and how they're really leading in the MSL space. Can you kind of give us an overview of what you do and um, what you're seeing in the medical science liaison track for pharmacists. Yeah, so um, so Sarah and I are we're MSL recruiters, um, and our company's called the Carolyn Group. So by day we help MSLs or aspiring MSLs find jobs, um, but we also um, I host this, the podcast MSL Talk, um, and then Sarah and I both have a coaching program. Um, for aspiring MSLs looking to break into their first position. So we we there's there's a multifaceted approach of how we work hand in hand with um, pharmacists um, that are looking to transition into um, the MSL role. And I think one of the foundations that we try to point people to is the podcast because the podcast is free information. It's hundreds of hours of of free content from experts in the medical affairs space that are just pouring out their their wisdom, their knowledge, their experience um, to folks that are just looking to learn about medical affairs. And Sarah's been on my podcast. That's how Sarah and I met was through the podcast, mm -hmm. through my podcast. Um, mm -hmm. And she's been, you know, probably my most frequent guest and probably my most popular guest. Her episodes actually outrank a lot of other guests that we've had on the show. That's incredible. Sarah, what, what made you think of the medical science liaison track and where were you before you went to the MSL role? Yeah, it's such a good question. I think you alluded to it when you kicked this off that it's, you know, the pharmacist personality can be a little bit nerdy. So I actually completed a drug information residency. I have a big passion for finding information. That's what I love to do. Uh, so that's what I did after I received my PharmD. I went straight into a DI residency, which I know they still have them today. This is 20 years ago, guys. Uh, and then that took me directly into a medical information role in a pharmaceutical company. So I worked in-house. I was the person that either wrote the standard response documents 
or responded to phone calls or different inquiries around the world, uh, which is another avenue I think that is great for pharmacists and PharmDs. Uh, but from that, I realized how much I like to communicate scientific data. And then that took me into the MSL role, which is very similar to working in-house. You're just going out and visiting different types of healthcare professionals and key opinion leaders, finding out what their problems are and then figuring out how to solve them. Uh, so that's that's what I loved about being an MSO. And I think it's such a great career path for pharmacists. Yeah, from what I hear from pharmacists that I talk with, we're going to be headed to the APHA 2024. Uh, the Pharmacy Podcast Network runs the APHA's podcast in the APHA booth. So we're excited and we have MSLs aligned on purpose to meet us there to talk about the roles and the, the purpose of what they're doing. Two of them work in um, the pharmaceutical industry. The other one works in um, AI and technology. So it will be really excited to, to talk with them. Um, and Tom, we're also celebrating an anniversary, uh, our 15th year of, of, of podcasting, the very first podcast about the pharmacy profession launched in March uh, of 2009. So it, it makes me feel old. <laughs> I'm gonna have to send you a cake. Yeah. <laughs> we'll celebrate together. That's right, we, we should. All right, so let's talk about MSLs and pharmacists taking this career path. Let's pretend I'm a pharmacist. I've been working for a Walgreens, which is a wonderful, um, company been in pharmacy for I can't even umpteen thousands of years, and um, I don't want to do this anymore. I I love serving clients. I I I don't want to be in um, in community pharmacy anymore, and I have an attraction to blood disorders, oncology, hyperlipidemia, and I want to become an expert in that. Is 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 my way of thinking? Is this leading me to an MSL role? Yeah, I mean, it could. It absolutely could. Sarah, I'll, I'll let you answer that since you kind of, that's kind of the route that you took. Yeah, and I think taking a step back is usually what I recommend to pharmacists that come at me with the kind of question, hey, I really want to be an MSL. The first thing that I ask back is just why MSL? And is it because it's the only role that you know about in the industry? Uh, because if so, you know, it's best to just expand your understanding a little bit about the different opportunities so that you're not just picking it to run away from the retail pharmacist that you're, you know, we want to take you towards something that is what you really want to do and not just run away from what you're doing now. Uh, so that's the first thing. But if you've done that work and you decide, I love to travel, I love to communicate with people, uh, I love, you know, really niching down into scientific data, then 100%, Todd, I think, you know, one really good step is to start listening to podcasts in that TA, figure out who are the digital opinion leaders out there putting out data, uh, really become an expert, you know, whether it's at pharmacy meetings or therapeutic meetings in your state that you can attend. You can usually attend those as a pharmacist for pretty cheap. I'm not saying you have to go to the national, you know, uh, oncology conferences. Pick one in your state that costs $100. We can all afford that. Uh, so you can start to network. You can start to develop therapeutic expertise in that space uh, and relationships, you know, again, network. So I think those are good places to start if you don't already have a therapeutic niche. Uh, and then just go from there. It's uh, it's definitely a career path that is worth uh, doing some you know legwork and figuring out if it's what you want to do, and then pursuing it 100%. How has the medical science liaison changed over the last 20 years? Not to pick on you, Sarah, but you said the word 20 years. So not only am I celebrating the 15th year of the Pharmacy Podcast Network, but I'm also celebrating my in my industry celebration of of 20 years in in pharmacy so i remember i don't even i never even heard the term msl until mm -hmm. about 2017 2018 where i was actually paying attention to it so talk to me about the changes and and are are we seeing an increase in demand in msls as a sector mm -hmm. of healthcare overall and is it a call out for pharmacists that are interested in it, that they should be a little bit more proactive in, in 
in going after an MSL opportunity? Yeah, I'll start with the part about, you know, is it increasing? And I think 100% yes, the opportunities are increasing. Almost every pharma or biotech company that has a product that's phase two or later will have, you know, either a couple of MSLs, if it's a small company or a large team of MSLs. And Todd, the biggest reason for this is access for commercial has gone down. And as access for commercial has gone down, these companies still need a way to get information to healthcare professionals and key opinion leaders. And traditionally, MSLs, because we have more of a peer-to-peer -peer interaction, can get access to those individuals. So you see the reduction in the commercial or the sales side and an increase in the medical side. With that, though, I think you pointed out 2017, 2018, there's a lot more uh, people that know about the MSL role. So whereas, you know, Tom, when he recruited 10 years ago, he was able to go after pharmacists and PharmDs with, you know, and, and recruit them. Right now, there's so much competition that it's tough to get your first role and you really have to have personal branding. You've got to start building your network. You have to do a lot of steps. Uh, so it's not just a matter of, hey, I, you know, I want to be an MSL. I'm going to get a cert certificate or I'm going to reach out to a recruiter. It's not an easy path. It's worth it. But I just want to say on the record, it's not an easy one. Tom, anything you know you want to add to that? Well, it's the roles involved a lot yep. in 20 years. Um, so I was a rep mm -hmm. for 10 years before I became a recruiter. And when I was a rep, we didn't have MSLs. Yep. So the, I worked for a division of Abbott Laboratories and we had a speakers bureau. So when we needed an expert, we would actually have to get somebody from the speakers bureau to come out and do presentations for us. So that was kind of like what our MSL access was. And then when I became a recruiter, you know, as, as you know, we're talking in 2002, 2003, we started recruiting MSLs and it was like a brand new thing. And back then, um, you know, there weren't a lot of people with experience. So we were recruiting, you know, pharmacists, PharmDs, people right out of, um, you know, and, and postdocs, right, kind of right out of school um, and turning them into MSLs. Fast forward, now the position has evolved and changed and become even more specialized. So now there's different varieties of MSLs that exist and everyone has them. So years ago, it was just large pharma that had MSLs. Now you have small biotechs with 10 employees that have MSLs. So it's really, the, the, the role has evolved, it's grown, um, but as Sarah said, it's also become a lot more competitive too. Tom, remember when the, the sales teams who were highly educated people, they definitely had a bachelor, master's degrees in biology, in um, some other life science, and they'd come out of school and sometimes they would enter. I went to Seneca Valley High School north of Pittsburgh. And I remember um, a friend of mine, her first name was Tara. I can't remember her last name, but right out of high school, I mean, right out of um, college, she got a position and to this day she's with them. So this is freaking 35, 40 year career as a um, non, farm d or non md or non phd but had a lot of um you know subject matter expertise and experience in biology and some other things so she worked for a pharma company we all thought she was a rock star she's just still doing well to this day um but i remember a day where you could be a sales rep talk to physicians and then all of a sudden there was a period of time in our histories healthcare that that was slammed by some governing body i don't know if it was fda or whatever but talk to me about the transition of hey you could just be a very educated sales rep and be able to to be very business savvy and talk to physicians about you know medications and and then all of a sudden now it's like no we're going the role if we're going to represent a pharma company to physicians and to uh, nurse practitioners and specialists 
it's going to be in a medical science liaison. So talk to us about the history of it. Yeah. So historically, what you're talking about, and when I was a rep, those were like the golden years. Those were yeah. the good old days where we, it was a schmooze fest. We would be sending doctors on vacations and trips and taking them out to lavish dinners and there were gifts and there, there really was, were no, kind of almost no limits to it. Well, then I think the FDA or the OIG, someone came in and said, no, you can't, you can't just keep doing this. Um, and they passed laws. So that's when the Sunshine Act mm -hmm. first originated and it put the clamps down on the pharmaceutical and biotech companies to say, no, you, you can't pay doctors anymore. That's not a thing. So now if the Smooth Fest is over and the sales reps who are promoting the use of these products, these drugs, are now handcuffed in a way, well, the pharmaceutical industry said, well, we still have to get the message out to physicians and we need to give them reasons to prescribe our, our products and our drugs. We're going to take science and data as our means of educating um, and it's in a non-promotional way so that they, we can't, you know, hopefully won't get hit with, you know, a corporate integrity agreement or get slapped with any lawsuits. Um, and that's how the MSO role actually became, you know, in vogue and why it became so important to the pharma industry is because now it's like, okay, well, we need to, to use our science and our data as the main mm -hmm. source of messaging. Um, Commercials here, medical affairs is here, firewall in between, um, yep. and we're we're gonna we're gonna take a non-promotional approach. Yep, that's really how it happened. It's almost like an evidence-based approach where now we've taken the the sales and the glitz out of it, and we're yep. starting to now we're not starting. We are now pushing the science and the evidence-based reporting, and uh, in the liaison is the information conduit. To really educate the provider, to educate um, the people that need to understand what's happening in this uh, compound or what's happening in this specific release or what stage of the clinical trial. Let's talk about specificity and niche because I love talking about niche. And I, every pharmacist that you're listening right now that want to transfer and, and have an opportunity to um, potentially become a, a medical science liaison, uh, the Carolyn group, uh, dot com, uh, Carol and a N group.com. I'll have a link in our show notes, but I want you to take us through, um, an example of how I would track this. So, um, and prefacing, I want to go back to what Sarah was saying. If you're listening and you have a desire, make it a path and it's a, it's a journey. You have to start putting something out. You have to get yourself out there. You have to blog. You have to podcast. You have to be a speaker. You have to be involved in research, maybe with your state pharmacy association, because there are now um, organizations within state pharmacy associations that are looking for subject matter expertise. It goes back to what you're passionate about. Uh, Tom and Sarah on our network, we have pharmacists talking about pediatrics, long-term care, artificial intelligence in pharmacy, clinical trials, uh, technology, like everything. So we have the verticals and I look at the MSL like that, where I'm saying, all right, I'm a pharmacist. I'm in long-term care. I'm consulting with seniors. I get really excited about the data that's coming out on dementia and some of the new drugs that are coming out on dementia. I'm going to write about it. I'm going to blog about it. I'm going to participate maybe in a white paper or even a journal article. Mm -hmm. There's an opportunity to now, if I have a desire to become a medical science liaison, to now be very specific. Where now, what if I'm, what if I have the one of the most popular blogs about dementia written by a pharmacist that now is really starting to get in the nitty gritty, the nerdiness of the data? Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit about that, about the, about taking the the preface and preparing to get our our name out there and our content out there and, 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 and what pathway it, it is to get us to that MSL opportunity. Yeah, go for it, Sarah. This is all you, this question. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, no, this this is a fabulous question, Todd. And I feel like you should be a, a partner for Tom and me during our coaching program yeah, because yeah, this sure. is we're, we're gonna get this going. This, this be is a yeah. This is what we tell pharmacists all day long because I think first and foremost, I don't want to rehash everything you said, but pharmacists generally come to us and say, "I can do everything." You know, I'm a pharmacist which is wonderful, but no pharma company cares that you can do every disease state. They want exactly what you just said, which is very niche down. Uh, and usually, you know, the, the people in our program, I say, you know, if you watch TV, what drug commercials are you seeing? Those are the kind of, you know, medicines that MSLs support. So which of those you know, really pique your interest and you want to go learn about them. Those are where you want to dig down. And, you know, the blogging is a good idea. Definitely attending your conferences, uh, you know, three to five disease states uh, isn't like a crazy amount within a specific niche. So you don't have to be so narrow that you're just migraine. You know, you can be neuro and then within neuro, you could be migraine, you could be Parkinson's, you could, you know, have several things under there. But if you come to me and say, I do neuro, I do oncology, I do cardiology and I do, uh, you know, I'm not sure what else pick one more, then it's just too much. You're just, you know, not going to be very marketable. Uh, and the other part of it, I think, is the resistance. And I'm sure you see this from pharmacists. Uh, in general, is the resistance to have a brand. They feel like it's bragging. It's not part of your personality. Uh, putting yourself out there is difficult. Uh, but what I say 100% is if you don't have anything out there, you still have a brand. If I Google your name and I find nothing, that's your brand. If I yeah. go to your LinkedIn and you don't have a picture, you have nothing, you have a brand. Whether you like it or not, we're in 2024. And this is the life that we live in. It's not going away. So I don't care that you hate social media. I don't care that you hate putting yourself out there. If you want to progress in your career in the industry or just anything, you've got to, you know, slowly but surely build that brand. And, you know, if you don't want to start a podcast, that's okay. See if you can be on a podcast. Everybody's come nervous to, to do it. To PPN. So, you know, mm -hmm. Just come on in. That's what we do. We grab the pharmacist. Mm -hmm. Build their voices. I want to give you a live example about what Dr. Sarah just said. Dr. Mm -hmm. Ravina Culler is an epidemiologist slash farm D. She nerds out on infectious diseases. And now because of her as a blogger, as a researcher, white paper, journal articles, like she sought after. So when she came on our show about the next gen um, level of COVID-19 and all of the variations and blah, blah, blah. I mean, it was incredibly, I have to, you have to listen to this episode for sure, but she is now sought after. She is, she gets, she's like, I, if I did nothing but speaking engagements for the next, you know, three years, I'd still have speaking engagements to go to. That is, and by the way, that does not happen overnight. Tom, four years podcasting, I'm at my 15th year podcasting. I would not be able to be sitting here now. I'd have to go get a real job, like my wife says, and, and go sell pharmacy software like I used to. And it, it takes time. So if you're thinking about doing it, you got to do it right now. And Sarah, thank you for saying about search. If I go to Google, I don't know how many times you Google yourself, um, but you should. You should Google yourself once a quarter at least, maybe once a month. Just see where your name's showing up. And if it's not showing up somewhere that where you want to be identified, you want to be a pediatric specialist pharmacist in the ICU so that you can talk about a specific medication and how dangerous it is and the dosing and the titration. There you go. Blog, podcast, write, you know, LinkedIn, network, network. And then now all of a sudden you have all this content out there, your name recognition, you might be a speaker somewhere. And now when you go to Tom and uh, and Sarah and, and you say, hey, I want to become a medical science liaison, you have traction and you have um, uh, an organization can look at you and say, I want this person. I want Sarah to represent us because she knows what she's talking about in fill in the blank, an HIV specialist or pediatrics or addiction or pain management or whatever it is, but find your niche and your passion and dig.
And I'll add to that. Um, first of all, if anyone listening to this, you need to follow Sarah on LinkedIn. She's a branding expert. It's amazing. Her content is so on point. It's so, um, it's inspirational. It's educational. She really has developed a tremendous branding expertise so she can give you really good examples of what you can do. But um, the idea of being an expert, a subject matter expert, or having a niche is not just a concept for the MSO world. It's, it's what employers want now. Employers in any field don't really want utility players anymore. They want subject matter experts. So it's what, what, so I'm actually writing a book right now, um, specifically for, for job seekers. And one of the things I talk about in the book is career identity. And you really have to establish your career, career identity and find out, you know, what are your strengths? What's your unique value proposition? Um, and what's your expertise? And even if it hasn't been established yet, what lane are you taking? What direction are you going in? So Todd, to your point, you know, you can start on your own through blogs and articles. And, and if you don't have a podcast, you go on other people's podcasts, like you said. So this is within all of our grasps and capabilities now because of the internet, because of all the tools that are available to us and just have fun with it, figure out what it is that you're really good at and what you want to do, and then just go for it. Sarah, I'm glad that um, Tom mentioned uh, LinkedIn. Um, I obviously have been connected to you for a while. Um, mm -hmm. I like the content that you're putting out about um, recruitment and about working with the Carolyn group. Um, I like the graphics. I like the whole flair. We're all human. Uh, we all have attention deficits. So content that go out goes out from the Pharmacy Podcast Network, by the way, is extremely high quality. It, it follows... Um, a journalistic way of putting content out. You're following that professionalism. All the stuff that you're doing from the Carolyn Group follows in line with exactly what you're promoting. So you're practicing what you're preaching. But before we close up today and um, just to let our listeners know, we're going to have Tom back to really dig into specific opportunities. And Tom, I want to I want to get real granular. I want to have opportunities that you're after us go to Intermountain and say Intermountain's looking for a specialist in blah, 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 blah. But wherever that is, if it's a medical science liaison, I'd love to help out with the pharmacist recruitment. But Sarah, talk to me about branding. Like, where would you start? If if I am a, blog, a light blogger, if I'm out there talking every once in a while, but if I want to bring this together, what should I do to, to brand myself as a PharmD? Well, the first thing is to get a good profile picture and LinkedIn. I mean, I guess let's take a step back. I think LinkedIn is the best place to start. Uh, I mean, I'm not super active on any other social media. I did quite a bit as an MSO on Twitter, uh, and that was designed to meet with digital opinion leaders, you know, again, as an MSO, I don't keep that up right now. So I, I would say it's easier to build a brand on one platform. So you're already working full time as a pharmacist doing what you're doing. So start to learn how to use LinkedIn, get a profile picture, get a good about section and get a good headline. And that's, I mean, that's three things that you can do in the next month that are very actionable and not completely overwhelming. And then one additional thing I think you already mentioned uh, is you know, just get out of your comfort zone a little bit and volunteer for something that you can get on that LinkedIn profile. So Tom mentioned, I met Tom by being on his podcast. I was an MSL. I listened to MSL talk. I was also a very avid podcast listener and I followed a lot of medical podcasts. And so I sent Tom a cold email. It was a cold email, meaning that we didn't know. We, we kind of knew of each other from the recruiting world, but he didn't know me from any other MSL. I volunteered and asked him if I could be part of my pot, part of his podcast. Uh, and I said, can we talk about podcasts? <laughs> so I said, I'd like to talk about how MSLs can talk about podcasts. 
Um, not that that all matters, but the bottom line I want people to know is I was very nervous to do that, to put myself out there. He could have said no, uh, and I probably would have felt sad and bad and, you know, went on my merry way. Uh, but you're, you're going to get some no's and you're going to get some people that don't respond to you. And that's OK. You just got to keep trying different avenues. And when one hits, it can really change a lot of things. And this one in particular did hit. We were able to do that podcast and then things changed from there. So you but, but it would have never happened if I wouldn't have gotten over my nerves and just done it. And not only was I ner you know, nervous to do the cold email, I was nervous to be on the podcast. You know, pharmacists aren't used to doing those kind of things. This is a new time. Uh, branding doesn't come natural. Like doing all these things on social media doesn't come naturally. So start small and just take little bits from there. Tom, I'm excited. Sarah, I'm excited. I've really enjoyed this. This is a piece of content in and of itself that the Pharmacy Podcast Network has been very interested in expanding on. Uh, Tom, you and I will have some follow-up conversations about taking MSL talk uh, into um, the pharmacist's ears a lot more often, especially if we could become um, very specific to um, specific roles that may be out there or that you're looking for in, in working with the Carolyn Group. Once again, Carolyn Group, that is Carolyn, C A R. O L A N G R O U P, carolyngroup.com. Look it up, or better yet, go to your Spotify, go to your Apple, go to any podcast directory, put in MSL Talk, or go to Google, put in MSL Talk um, in your favorite podcast directory, and it'll come right up. You're all over the place. Tom, Sarah, this has been wonderful. Um, thank you for being part of this week in pharmacy. Awesome. Todd, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Congratulations on 15 years of tremendous success. Love what you're doing. And I'm so grateful that we could be a part of it. Um, so thank you for having us on. Thank you. Thanks, we'll Todd. Talk to you guys soon.